On Okinawa, the U.S. Army and Marines were destroying the last line of Japanese resistance, cave by cave. You'd get the interpreter up there, beg them to come out, and they wouldn't come out. They might send somebody out and shoot at you or something like that, so, so you'd just seal them up. Uh, there were a lot of them that were sealed. They'd get a bulldozer in there and just cover up the entrance to the cave. The horrible thing about flame is it doesn't have to hit you. It sucks out all the oxygen. And uh, you'd see people in the caves, uh, soldiers, Japanese, not a mark on them. They suffocated because there was no air oxygen to breathe. It was gone. Marines learned not to trust those who surrendered, even civilians. Some people came out, and this old lady in a kimono, she looked old, and uh, she pulled out a grenade from under her armpit and threw it at a corporal. It was an American grenade. I don't know where she got it, but she pulled the pin and threw it and blew him to kingdom come. Uh, I saw her do it, and uh, so I shot her, and quite a few others. Many civilians in the caves, like those on Saipan, preferred death before surrender. Forty-six student nurses shared a cave with the army. Suddenly, I heard a call for surrender coming from above. Are there any soldiers or civilians in the cave? Come out naked if you are a man, and come out waving a handkerchief if you are a woman. He repeated the call again and again, but no one responded. We had been told not to be captured. Captives would be despised as traitors, forever bringing shame to themselves and to their entire family. We had also been told that the Americans would kill men instantly, and women would be raped and run over by tanks. Again, the voice said, we are going to blow up this cave if you don't come out. Still, no one responded. Some Japanese soldiers started firing. And in response, the American soldiers threw in a grenade. I clung to the rugged rocks and raised my head only to be choked. Everybody started screaming, Mother, help me! Father, help me! Teacher, help me! I can't breathe! Help! Help! I don't remember waking up, but my friend told me later that I was buried under dead bodies. Only seven of the 46 student nurses survived. As Americans approached General Ushijima's cave, he retreated to its depths. For a general, death before surrender entailed a ritual. He knelt, facing north toward the Imperial Palace. Thank you. 
After 82 days, the Battle of Okinawa was over. More than 70,000 died trying to defend it. More than 12,000 died trying to take it. An additional 36,000 were wounded. Almost one third of the invasion force were casualties. The survivors would invade Japan. Reporters are saying that the Japanese are the best cave and hill fighters in the world, and Okinawa is just a, an inkling of what's going to come when we actually hit the main Japanese islands. The American people are anxious to end this thing. There's a sense of over by 45, but nothing in the character of these battles gave any indication that the Japanese were going to surrender. How do you end this on both sides? I mean, you, you have to achieve an understanding. Now, with the Nazis, it was pretty easy. The understanding was, we walked over your entire country. You surrendered. Well, Japan hadn't been walked over. What was the understanding? What was the basis for war termination? The Japanese wouldn't say surrender. How do you end it? How do you end it quickly? How do you end it efficiently? These questions faced America's new president, Harry Truman who succeeded Franklin Roosevelt after he died in April. Okinawa was Truman's first battle as commander-in-chief, and it weighed heavily on him. Shall we invade Japan proper, or shall we bomb and blockade, he wrote in his diary on June 17th. That is my hardest decision to date. When he met with his advisors the next day, Truman was more concerned about casualties than a quick end to the war. Army Chief of Staff George Marshall was less concerned about casualties than ending the war quickly. He presented the invasion plan the chiefs had agreed on. To establish air bases, the U.S. would invade southern Kyushu with nine divisions. Intelligence predicted six Japanese divisions would have to defend the entire coastline. On beaches in the south, invaders would outnumber the defenders by three to one. The Kyushu bases would facilitate air support for an assault on Tokyo in 1946. Truman never got a forthright answer on potential casualties. Marshall essentially evades giving a direct answer to that question. At one point, Admiral Leahy, uh, Truman's chief of staff, suggests it'll be like Okinawa, 35% of the committed forces. Since we're talking about using about 776,000 men on Kyushu, that works out to more than 200,000 casualties, but nobody works that out. This is really the five-star general talking to the World War I captain. Ten weeks or so in office, still new and uneasy in the position, and here's a older, seasoned warrior, a man who commands great respect, Marshall, and he lectures the president and at one point, he tells the president, basically, don't delay things and be irresolute. It's important to make tough decisions and be a leader. Hoping to avoid what he called an Okinawa from one end of Japan to the other, Truman approved only the Kyushu landing, and only after all the chiefs endorsed it. He postponed a decision on invading Tokyo. Only two weeks after committing himself to a fight to the finish, the emperor summoned his war cabinet. It was June 22nd, the day Okinawa fell to the Americans. The emperor's conference with this inner cabinet was indeed a critical moment and extremely unusual in the nature of Japanese politics because the emperor in fact took the lead indicated that he wanted the government to actively pursue a diplomatic option, mediating an end to the war. Not surrendering, mediating an end to the war that would be acceptable to Japan. 
The diplomatic option also had to be acceptable both to General Anami, who led the military faction in the war cabinet, and to Foreign Minister Togo, who led an emerging peace faction. The Emperor had been warned the Soviet Union might enter the war against Japan. Nonetheless, the War Cabinet decided to ask the Soviet Union to mediate. For military, I think it is very important to keep the Soviet out of the war. They were quite aware that they could not afford to have a two-front war. And Togo thought that Moscow approach, I think, is crucial to terminate the war. There was no decision on what peace terms Japan might offer. As Hirohito made overtures to the Soviets, Truman set off to meet their leader, Joseph Stalin. He went to the Berlin suburb of Potsdam to discuss post-war Europe with Allied leaders and to see that Stalin kept a promise to enter the war against Japan after Germany was defeated. The Allies had promised Stalin territorial concessions if he entered the war. Stalin told Truman he would on August 15th. Truman's diary entry that night read, Feeny Japs when that comes about. In Potsdam, Truman received word from the director of the Manhattan Project. The atom bomb had been tested successfully at Alamogordo, New Mexico. Believe Japs will fold up before Russia comes in, he wrote. I'm sure they will when Manhattan appears over their homeland. Within days after these optimistic diary entries, intelligence from intercepted Japanese military cables, called Ultra, was alarming. In June, the invasion planners projected three Japanese divisions in southern Kyushu. By July, there was evidence of nine divisions, triple the number in just one month. Ultra told a startling story in July of 1945. Japanese units were moving into southern Kyushu at an alarming rate. It was as if the in very invasion beaches were magnets drawing the Japanese forces to those places where the Americans would have to land and fight their way ashore. It was very clear.